Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of, um, uh, I just guess these are just kind of fucking rants, are they, with, uh, me, your man, Get Back the Great. <sighs> nice kind of Ian Brew here today. Ah, oh, lovely stuff. Um, yeah, not much of a, um, I, I'm, I've got to say, actually, I'm sorry about, um, not uploading a, um, uh, not uploading a uh, podcast on Friday, but um, unfortunately, uh, Phil or aka Flash Suppressor, who I usually record the uh, podcast with, he wasn't available on Thursday night to record, so uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to upload a podcast or any video really on Friday. Um, I've, I um, like I said uh, a couple of weeks ago, this sort of uploading schedule is still a bit rough around the edges, it's still te it's still you know, sort of kind of like a rough. Um, sort of thing in the works, and uh, so you know it's going to take a bit of a, uh, you know, trial and error to get it just right. But um, yeah, hopefully you should get to that point soon enough. Um, there's been you know there's been a fair few bits and bobs here recently uh, that are good to talk about. One I think that is, um, I mean. One, um, one of course, one that's been weighing a bit on my mind recently has been uh, my favourite team, Charlton Athletic, lost again this weekend. Uh, we lost three nil to uh, Sheffield Wednesday. I think we're pretty much relegated at this point. Uh, we've only got like about what eight or so games left of the season, and we're still like second from the bottom. So like we're pretty much fucked at this point anyway. It's like. I doubt we're going to pull off like a Leicester City and like manage to rescue it like literally the last few games of the season. So chances are we're kind of screwed at this point anyway. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, like I said before, you kind of just have to deal with that sometimes. You know, you might support a particular team, but the team you might end up supporting might just be quite crap. And the thing is, I think, you know, you have to kind of support the football team that you know, where you're from or what, you know, who your family support, like I said, like I, I lived, the first place I lived in after I was born was Charlton and about like 90% of the people in my family who, lo who like football are Charlton supporters, so, uh, you know, it makes sense really and I do like the way they play sometimes but it's just like in recent years when we've been bringing in these really crappy second, third tier Belgian players who just really have not been delivering it whatsoever, it's just like, it's like maybe like two or three at the most have been any good and it's just that like the rest have just been rubbish so you kind of just have to deal with that sort of thing sometimes I suppose it's just kind of a way of life I mean like my old man said you know there's you know there's more to life than football there's more to life than you know competitive sports you know you, there's still many other kind of ways you can be entertained and sort of occupied out there in life so you know it's not like the end of the world I mean I'm disappointed I'm angry and I'm upset but it, you know it's like you know, there is more to life than football and that sort of thing. So, you know, it's not like the end of the world. It's not like, uh, it's not like, um, you know, someone is like proposing to reverse the 1973, you know, Equal Pay Act or something like that. You know, it's not something really genuinely bad like that. So, uh, you know, hopefully life will continue on normally and, uh, get better, hopefully. Um... Speaking of like bigger and more important things, uh, one thing that's been in uh, the news a lot recently here in the UK has been the uh, the Chancellor's budget for 2016. Um, Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, a um, bit of a controversial figure, not only in British politics in general and society in general, but also in the Conservative Party as well. He's you know seen as very much a deviation from a old school classical conservatism um you know yeah i think what you may think of the man but like sometimes he does make some highly irrational decisions like the bedroom tax was never really going to get that much support was it let's face it um you know um but i mean there's you know there are one or two points about his recent budget that are all right uh, I might go into them at a later point either on this channel or on my pod or on my education channel um but, um, you know, one that sort of just kind of sticks in my mind that I just don't really see the point in is the tax on sugar and stuff like that. It's like, 
thing is, people are still going to be buying this sort of stuff, even if you raise up the price of it. They're going to buy it more and more. You know, there's going to be a glut in the market for this sort of thing, and you know, they're going to continue buying like sugar and alcohol and fags. And sorry, I didn't mean to say fags as in a sort of a derogatory term for homosexuals. I mean like fags as in, you know, that's a slang term used for cigarettes and cigars over here in the UK. So I apologise if anyone of a homosexual inclination was offended by that, not my intention at all. But, um, yeah, I mean, like, you know, taxes on, like, alcohol and uh, tobacco and uh, sugar, you know, surely, you know, the more logical way to combat the more adverse social effects of those kind of things, those kind of vices, would be really to, um, you know, increase education about these sort of things. Um, I mean, surely it makes more sense to teach about the dangers of something like sugar or something, you know, rather than uh, just making it more expensive. It just seems like, to me, like a way of alleviating the responsibility that, um, you know, that the government or the uh, Public Health Education Board has away from themselves onto the companies making these products. And to me, you know, I can understand the sentiment that they're coming from, but at the same time, it, to me, it just seems a bit disingenuous. You know, it's just like, you know, here's a big social problem. Britain's very obese. We're the most obese country in Europe. You know, it's like, but at the same time, we're not really going to do anything socially to combat this uh, problem. We're not going to sort of, you know, increase education about the dangers of over overeating sugar and, you know, an overabundance of sugar in your diet. We're just going to sort of lump the blame on, you know, the companies who, yeah, they shouldn't, you know, they should be regulating their products maybe a little bit more, but at the same time, you know, they they can only do so much, and I think at this point we really need the government and the Public Health Education Board in the NHS and people like that to, you know, just bring about more education about these sort of things, you know, about the more adverse effects of sugar and alcohol and tobacco and saturated fat and really and stuff like that. And it, it's just like, I feel like, it's, sort of like the t it's just like the same kind of principle behind... Um, you know, parents in the late 90s and early 2000s calling for more regulation on violent video games and films. It's like, yeah, I can understand where you're coming from, but at the same time, it's just like, surely the better argument to make is these parents should be, you know, educating their children, you know, you know, you, you can sort of like enact these sort of uh, violent acts in video games, or you might see them in, you know, some films, but that does not mean that they're all right to do. And then you explain to them why it's not okay to do those things, why it's not okay to do those things in real life. So they then know not to do those things in real life. It's it's a remarkably simple thing. And like I hear so many people just refusing to do it. And it just, it just exasperates me and pisses me off that the fact that people are willing to put so much blame away from themselves that rightfully should be theirs when they fuck up and put it on the, on the shoulders of someone else who, you know, doesn't even deserve this kind of sort of blame and critique and sort of, you know, malarkey. I mean, I just, oh, it's just a, it's a long old sort of problem and this sort of principle has been going back, you know, for about 20 years or so now. But um, I think, you know, if the government do want to tackle, you know, the more adverse social health problems of things like sugar, tobacco and saturated fat and salt and alcohol and stuff like that, they should really just be trying to create a better camp a social campaign or public campaign of educational awareness about the adverse effects of these kind of things and you know doing tv programs radio shows pamphlets uh you know broadcasts uh you know getting the nhs to educate people more about it it's just like it just strikes me as a remarkably simple thing to do and yeah it might require a lot of effort and money put into it but it's going to be at the end of the day a lot more efficient and uh money saving in the long run to do that rather than say just oh let's just levy a tax on sugar that's probably not going to get that much support and it's probably just not going to work anyway and it's going to piss people off and you know it's probably going to end up driving some smaller sugar-based businesses away you know it's like come on man you know you look at this thing logically they're not going to sort of you know people are still going to buy these things regardless you know they as a society we are kind of addicted to sugar and tobacco and stuff like that, which isn't a good thing inherently, it's not a good thing really, so, you know, I can't defend that too much, but at the same time, it's like, you know, take some responsibility for it, part of the, 
the reason why the UK is so obese is because we don't really have a great system of health education in this country, unlike, say, in, you know, in France or Sweden, where, you know, health education and education about the nutrition values of certain foods and, in, uh, you know, ingredients and products and stuff like that is quite extensive, you know. The, um, I think probably the country where I've heard most about this sort of thing of educating people about the culinary and nutritional value of food is probably Italy, um, where they literally teach it in, like, primary schools and even high schools to some degree and it's it's brilliant seeing these little kids just learn about what's good to eat what's not good to eat you know what's the right amount of like treats and stuff to have here and there you know it's really heartening to see you know the italian government say you know take a bit of responsibility and going all right we need to educate the young uns about this sort of stuff we really need to you know get it into their heads that you know that it's it's not always a good idea to eat this sort of stuff they've got to have these things as like treats here and there oh so yeah, I mean, that's the main sort of political thing that's really been kind of happening really over here in the UK recently. It's uh, fortunately, it's, uh, I don't think the um, the budget for the minister this uh, year is as bad as it was last year. Last year, I do think it was quite a despicable sort of proposal of uh, policies that he was bringing about. But uh, this year, it seems a little bit more um, uh, chilled out, but... Uh, still kind of somewhat illogical and I just think you know it's not entirely practical really the way we're going around tackling these certain issues so it, you know it could be done better really um, I think um, what else I've been doing recently um, oh yes I went to see um, I went to see uh, Kung Fu Panda 3 recently with um, Flash Suppressor and uh, I was a really big fan of the first uh, two Kung Fu Panda films when they first came out. Um, really big influences on my view of sort of animated films in particular and you know cinema in general. Um, really really good films. Um, you know it's probably some of the best acting you know, Jack Black has ever done either physical or sort of voice acting. So, you know, big props to the guy. Gets a lot of hate, but I like him personally. I think he's a good actor. Um, you know, of course he has a couple of slips up, but, you know, what actor doesn't really? Um, and, uh, yeah, it's like a... I've written a blog post about the my review of the... Uh, uh, of Kung Fu Panda 3, which I'm going to put in the video, uh, the video description of this um, of this video below. So check out check that out if you fancy. Um, and uh, I mean, overall, I think the Kung Fu Panda 3 is probably the weakest uh, out of the three uh, Kung, Fu, Kung Fu Panda films. Um, but that doesn't mean it's a bad film by any stretch. I mean, there are some sort of bits and bobs here and there that aren't too great. Like, I don't really like the visual design of the main villain all that much. And its narrative is a little bit rushed. Um, you know, it does skim... It doesn't really skim on sort of, like, character development. Because the character development in this film is actually quite well done. But it's just, like, the central narrative is a bit sort of, like, hard run by. It's a bit sort of uh, quickly paced over. And it doesn't get dry, but it just, like... It gets dry quicker than you'd probably expect so much. Um, the character development is good, though. Uh, the action is great, as always. The music is good. The voice acting is good. Uh, it's probably got the best animation out of any of the Kung Fu Panda films, really. And it's probably got the best animation I've seen in a, a new um, animated film since uh, How to Train Your Dragon 2, when that was released almost a couple of years ago now. Uh, it's a really, really superbly animated film, Kung Fu Panda 3, and it's, you, you know, of course it's a cartoon, so, you know, there's also the belief, there's, there is the, you know, non-belief there that, you know, oh, well, this can't be real because it's, of course, a cartoon, it's not real life, but at the same time, the textures on the, uh, you know, the bodies of the animals, like their fur and feathers and stuff like that, the way they move, is second to none, and you generally feel like you can reach out and sort of uh, touch them and sort of, like, f you know, feel the texture of them uh, in in not just how they sort of move in terms of the animation but also the sort of v actual visual design of the characters themselves it's second to none it really is it's truly superb it's one of the best looking and animated sort of uh, animated films I've seen probably in my whole life it's truly superb I mean it's just a pity that it sort of rounds off the Kung Fu Panda trilogy with a bit of a weak source story 
but and uh, you know sort of slightly you know a villain who isn't bad at all really but it, you know it could have been slightly better it probably it does help though a lot that the uh, villain is voiced by jk simmons who is you know a superb actor and great vo you know he doesn't do voice acting all the time but um and a couple of stints he's done in voice acting have been rather good and he certainly doesn't disappoint here so you know if you like your jk simmons definitely check this one out um, he's actually quite comedic in this one, which is nice because you don't really hear him be comedic too much. Although, to be honest with you, actually, I did think to some degree that was a bit of a downfall of um, Kung Fu Panda 3. You know, I sort of felt like um, I sort of felt like to some degree that the um, that the main villain was a bit overly comedic and you know to some degree or another that did kind of sort of hurt the narrative well no not well not so much the narrative because the narrative was already a bit clunky from the direction and writing a bit but um it just kind of like took away some inherent threat of the villain uh in that the villain was made to look a bit goofy and stupid and stuff like that and you know they of course wanted to clearly establish the villain as like this intimidating powerful force of nature and death and the sort of destruction and they certainly do do that his physical design isn't terrible it's you know he's clearly a big imposing villain and you know jk simmons really lends his voice to the act and really helps to make this villain a truly sort of harsh intimidating son of a bitch you know who just really sort of scares the bejeebus out of you um uh, if you take him seriously enough, which of course, like I said, is just a bit tricky considering how much they play him off as a comic book, sort of a comic uh, relief villain. And I think, fortunately enough, you know, people don't do that too much these days. They tend to, if they want to make a comic relief villain, they just straight up do that. Or if they want to, you know, um, do a serious villain, they just straight up do that. Um, more often now than ever. And I feel like sometimes if you go like 50 50 on both a comic relief and uh serious villain you might end up just you know sort of really harming the credibility and sort of uh believability of the main antagonist of your film regardless of whether or not it's something that kung fu panda 3 uh you know a superhero film a um you know a western action film a sort of a a, a courthouse drama a you know a teenage uh teeny bopper sort of a dance film no, anything really. The the antagonist has to, you know, you have to mark the antagonist out as, you know, s you know, as having a clearly defined sort of purpose and direction in the film. Um, and you know, there are some cases where this, you know, isn't done and the f film still, you know, has a considerable presence and sort of purpose within the film. Although even then, you know, usually the purpose of those kind of villains is more that they're, you know, kind of mysterious or alluding to some deeper meaning within the film itself, such as, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey or something like that. Um, but in a film like Kung Fu, Kung Fu Panda 3, you do have to kind of have a very focused, defined sort of villain with a very sort of centred you know, I don't want to say regimentalised, but sort of very clearly organised and centred uh, motivation and purpose within the sort of film. And, you know, the um, the motivation for the, uh, for the villain in Kung Fu Panda is believable enough, but his sort of, like, purpose and core believability is just a bit ho-hum, really. Um, which is sad, because... The animation on him is great, and like I said, J.K. Simmons' vis uh, sort of vocal performance is superb. The guy can really voice act. Let me tell you something. Um, and the animation overall is superb. Anyway, uh, I think it's it's a good outing, though. Despite my misgivings and despite my thoughts about it, it is a really good film. It's you know it's a good animated film for the kiddies. It's a good animated film for. You know, generally people who are just looking for a light-hearted night out or, you know, a family night out or something like that. Uh, I'm not going to pretend it's, like, the best animated film of all time. It's um, it's certainly the weakest out of the three main uh, Kung Fu Panda films, and I do think it could have been a bit better. But, for what it's worth, it is superb, and it's got some of the best animation and visual design I've ever seen in an animated film, let alone the Kung Fu Panda series. So, I'd definitely give it a recommendation. If you've got, like, little kids or little siblings or cousins or stuff like that, definitely take them to see it and if you want to if you think oh that looks like quite good but i don't have anyone to go with 
just go see it by yourself. It's still a good film, even you know, in of itself. I mean, I did go to see it with my with um, Flash Suppressor, and I mean, we both liked it. We're both like in our early twenties, and we're both like big blokey dudes, and like we, you know, we still managed to like it because we, we, you know, we were able to look past who the demographic uh, of who it was for, and you know, appreciate the film as it was and what it was as a film on its own as well as a film within the Kung Fu Panda series. And we both really, really liked it. So, yeah, I'd say give it a recommendation. Uh, you might sort of think differently about the... Um, uh, about the... Um, uh, faults of the film than I do. But then again, you know, everyone has their own tastes. Uh, I think, you know, give it a chance anyway. It does deserve a bit of love and sort of a... And uh, support because it wraps up the uh, story of the uh, first three um, Kung Fu Panda films, you know, nicely enough. Uh, the first act is a bit of a slog, but it does start to pick up narrative speed later on. So the narrative isn't all bad. It, it's 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 got a decent enough story anyway. Um, I would I would recommend it. Yeah, I think I'll put the link to my written blog review of it in the. In the video description below so you guys can have a check out for yourself but yeah i'd say give kung fu panda 3 a look and uh have a look for yourself to see if you really do genuinely like the idea of it i would say watch the first two first though um animated series is good but you know it's not absolutely core necessary watching to understand the third film so but i would uh i would recommend watching the first two films if you haven't already to uh you know get a better grip of the uh third film's narrative and who the characters are because uh, it does follow on a bit from the um, overall narrative of the three films and certainly a bit of the ending of the second film. So, yeah, I'd probably say... I would actually say uh, watch the first two films first before you see this. Mm. I mean, I know I know that's not always um, a core recommendation with sequels, and to some degree I can respect sequels that... Um, it, no, actually, no. For the most part, I do rec I do respect sequels of films and video games as well, for that matter. That you know don't just rely on the laurels and wealth of their uh, predecessors, but you know are able to stand on their own two uh, legs and you know establish themselves as you know either something different or something that's similar, but is able to create its own identity out of that similar thing. And um, I think all I think both of the Kung Fu Panda. Th films have, were able to do that well enough um you know even considering how uh you know popular the first film was you know the first film was all about sort of a you know a concentration and sort of discipline the second film was a much sort of it was, you know, was considerably darker and bigger in scale and sort of drama and you know it was more about um uh, you know, balance, and then the third film is more about finding yourself, and you know, more and focuses on more personal matters. But they all, you know, follow on nicely from each other. I think, you know, you can do that in both games and films, and uh, the Kung Fu Panda series does that very, very, very nicely. I think, um, I think probably a series of films that maybe doesn't do that so well is probably. Uh, I know we're going really downhill from here by comparing this to uh, Kung Fu Panda, but the um, the night the museum sort of series uh, of films. I did like the first two films. Didn't really like the third film so much, but um, there's a sort of series of films that have you know sort of good sort of you know decent enough story, but you know kind of over rely on the laurels and the wealth and sort of the narrative of the previous films each time to you know build up its own story and as a result the the sequels did become increasingly worse and worse and worse in the uh night of the museum series i did still like the second film to some degree but at the same time it was clearly a lot less uh compelling than the first one shall we say and the third one just mm, yeah uh i mean you know they were all decent enough kid films but it's like it was clear even back when I started disliking them as little and that they were getting less and less good as time went on, which was a bit disappointing because I did used to love the uh, Night at the Museum book and um, the three films, so it was a bit disappointing really. But, you know, that's just one example like of, you know, the Kung Fu Panda series which does that well and the Night at the Museum series which doesn't. And 
I think, you know, more often than not, films should try and be creative and not use the uh, sort of a uh, cultural standing and sort of importance of their predecessors to, you know, stand up above the rest. You know, they should try and, you know, mark themselves out as something of their own. Uh, you know, you know, of course, carry on the narrative and carry on a nice little continuation of the story and sort of carry on the characters and their motivations and their development. But at the same time, you know, don't just like repeat the same old formula. You know, try to carve out your own identity within the not only the narrative of your film series, but also, you know, films in general. And I always say this for, for video games as well. Like, um, you know, Jack and Dexter 2 was on the PlayStation 2 was a great sequel to. Uh, the highly popular Jack and Dexter 1. And, um, yeah, it had a very, very different uh, tone, gameplay style, narrative, and uh, sort of system of uh, progression than the first game did. Even though both, you know, had a lot of similar aesthetic themes and uh, colour palettes, and, uh, you know, most of the main characters remained, so it was, you know, it was still very much similar in the core sense of who was there and who's who um so you know i definitely think uh that's a good example of a you know a good continuation of a franchise in video games and th it goes that goes like 10 times more so for uh jack and dexter 3 as compared to jack and dexter 2 so you know it's a series that really did go well in sort of a uh you know creating its own identity while, you know, paying homage to, you know, the previous entries in said series, you know, in that they, you know, we were able to continue the narrative really nicely, but at the same time we were able to, you know, con you know mark each preceding game out with its own identity, which I really admired, and, uh, I mean, Jack and Dexter 3 still remains to this day, like, one of my favourite um, third-person sort of platformers of all time. It's a superb game, and really, really recommend it. Um, so, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, Kung Fu Panda is definitely a, uh, a similar equivalent of that in, uh, the film, fr film, um, industry. I think it does do it very well, despite its, uh, misgivings and faults here and there. I think it is much harder to do that sort of thing, um, you know, in comparison to, you know, just lazily relying on the, uh, cultural stature of um, your franchise already up to that point, um, which is unfortunately a lot of things, which have, which is unfortunately something that a lot of, um, you know, video game and filmmakers tend to rely on a little bit too much, I feel, which, you know, does make me feel a little bit sad, you know, it's like a kind of a crux for creativity, you know, it's kind of like something you can rely on that, you know, you can substitute for, you know, genuine creativity and sort of talent and I feel like it's, it does kind of piss me off a little bit that that does happen so, so much these days I mean it's, it's it doesn't happen all the time and I think in the last couple of years it's been happening less and less and less but um, at the same time you know it's, I don't like it too much when that happens um, so what else have I been doing recently um, nothing much really actually too much recently um, I um I, I, my mum came down to, from London to see me in Brighton, um, and uh, oh, there was something else I was going to talk about, wasn't there? Um, yeah, that was it. I um, actually, this was something actually that I was. I was recently thinking about because um, I did a restaurant review. I did a restaurant review recently on my um, on my written blog. This really nice little cafe called uh, Cafe Coho in Brighton, and there's a couple of different little branches of that place in Brighton. And the, you know, it's like kind of like a weird cross between sort of indie cafes and like greasy spoons and stuff like that. They're really, really nice. They have quite nice rustic sort of chic furniture. You know, the staff in there are usually quite friendly and helpful. And, you know, it's good pricing for what you get in there. And the quality of food and drink in there is really, really nice. Um, um, but when I was, you know, I took a couple of pictures, but I didn't make it clear that I was writing, going to write up a review as I was eating when I left the place. Um, 
But it did get me thinking, um, when you're writing a review of uh, something like, say, a, you know, a venue or a, a restaurant, you know, it's kind of like the very few sort of things I'd say you, um, you kind of have to be a bit more anonymous with when you're reviewing them as compared to, say, something like a film or a video game or a, you know, or a sports game or, um, you know, or an album or a book where you can, you know, you can be quite open and frank about it, but I feel like with your personal identity, when you're sort of conducting the investigation to base your review of a venue or a restaurant or something like that off of, I feel like I have to be a little bit more anonymous um, with what I'm doing, and I certainly felt like that when I was doing this review of Cafe Coho, and it's not something that really plays into my mind too much when I'm doing reviews of restaurants or stuff like that on my... Uh, blog um but at the same time it did play into my mind a little bit and sort of helped me influence me a little bit in how i approach the review of that place and i mean it's a good cafe it's really really good cafe um but um i did think to myself i've got to be a little bit more anonymous you know not influence them too much hopefully you know so that they won't sort of realize oh this guy's reviewing us we should you know give him extra service because i want to just you know see how the place operates under you know perfectly normal circumstances whereas i don't know say with like a i don't know like a film or a um a, a, an album a music album or a video game you can tend to just be like as open and frank as you can about it because it's not something like say where the creators uh work on it is going to be influenced by your personal judgment and moral disposition on it beforehand whereas like say you know, going to a venue, going to a shop, uh, going to a restaurant, that will be very much the opposite case. So I feel like when I'm reviewing something like a restaurant or something like that, I have to be objective as possible, of course, as I do with all my reviews and uh, stuff like that. I mean, you know, of course you can never be fully objective. Objectivity is a, a sort of very zen thing. You can never really fully attain it. But at the same time, I feel like I have to be very much more anonymous with a sort of a restaurant or a venue review than um i do with music or video games or films it's just like it's a very physical sort of um emotional thing and i feel i feel it's quite a sort of a natural thing to do really i suppose there are some people out there who don't do that so much but i personally prefer to you know keep it on the low key until i actually write up my review of said restaurant or something like that so you know that the staff don't have to worry about oh let's you know serve this guy really well so he can give us a really good review because i want to give them as honest a review as possible i don't want my judgment to be clouded by any sort of uh you know at, i wouldn't say adverse actually but um you know any um extra sort of uh functions on the part of the service so i would you know prefer to just experience the place as a normal person and just you know go about my business from there really uh now, it depends on, you know, someone's perspective of, like, what kind of review they're doing, you know, as to how they might conduct their investigation for their review, but I don't know, I just, that's always how I tend to feel whenever I'm doing a review of a restaurant, I never make it clear that I'm doing a review or that I'm a critic of any sort, so I just kind of keep it on the low key, you know, trying to make myself too obvious. I mean, if I get famous off of it, then, you know, oh well, that's nice, it'll be nice for that to happen, I'm not going to put my hopes up too high I'm still quite small fry when I think about it but I think you know it would be nice yeah it would be nice but I do still think anonymity uh, is probably the best port of call when you're doing a review of something like a venue or a restaurant so I'd definitely say do that uh, and I haven't really been doing much else recently apart from going to that cafe, uh, going to see Kung Fu Panda 3, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I haven't really watched any new TV shows um, recently. I remember I did talk a while back about how I finished, really quickly finished, um, oh, pardon me, The uh, Legend of Korra, and um, for the first time in like a couple of years, uh, I finished the uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. I, of course, was a big fan of Avatar The Last Airbender as a little kid, and... Uh, um, I didn't really watch uh, The Legend of Korra until like a couple of months ago and then I finished both of them like uh, a few weeks ago and they're both superb animated series 
Um, I mean, more people like uh, uh, Last Airbender, but I just personally like Korra a little bit more. Um, just personal preference, really. Um, and But apart from that, I haven't really watched any new sort of uh, sh TV shows recently after those two. There's some good TV shows on Amazon, because I've got Amazon Prime, so I'm able to watch a lot of their uh, shows. Um, if you know, for a very small monthly fee... Uh, on an unlimited basis, you know, I watched some of the uh, Sonic Sat AM, oh, which was really good Sonic the Hedgehog 90s cartoon. I mean, I wasn't that big into Sonic the Hedgehog when I was little, but that cartoon was actually pretty decent. Um, I, I tried to watch this live action series that was that's been going on for the last couple of years called um, Vikings, but it's just I just couldn't do it. The acting in it was fucking dreadful, and I just hated it. Actually, hated it and. It was one of the most droll, boring, you know, shows I've ever seen. I tried to watch the first two episodes, and they were just some of the most boring thing, some of the most boring TV serial acting I've ever seen. And I know it's like the first two f episodes are going to be more pilot uh, driven, but at the same time, it's just like you could put a little bit more effort into your visual and sort of vocal acting than that, man. Come on, seriously, I really just did not feel emotionally invested. And you know, that's got to be bad when, say, I feel more emotionally invested in a animated girl wearing a uh, Inuit sort of style poncho, uh, you know, bending water with her inner chi, fighting, um, you know, magical powers and, sort of, you know, people of the night, but I guess that's just the rambling of a crazy man. So, uh, I don't know. Guess I'll see you guys on the battlefield and all that shit because I've pretty much run out of everything to say now and I've also run out of time. So, till next time, have fun with whatever you're doing and I'll see you guys on the battlefield. Kind of a bit of an abrupt ending, but you know, eat my doo doo, son of a bitch. <laughs>